Cool. So I always start um, just turning off everything because the main indicator is obviously, you know, the moving averages, right? So that's what you want to focus on. Um, so the bog is a time-based stochastic indicator, right? So if you've studied TA long enough or market cycles, you understand that everything moves cyclically according to a sine wave. And so with this indicator, if you can align it yeah, such so that you, you're you aligning it up with the time cycle, you can get predictive cycles into the future, if that makes sense. So like right. if it's cycling on 30 days, you can presume that it's going to fall within, you know, 28 days or 29 or 31, somewhere in there, right? And which is the same concept as Elliott waves, that waves move in this three leg pattern or five leg pattern, but like three hump pattern. Mm -hmm. And that it is predictable based on the last um, wave. Right. In theory. Uh, hold on. I'm going to get rid of the join noise. Okay. Cool. Yeah. So the first thing I'm going to do, I actually like the Bitcoin Cash chart a little bit better. Uh, a little bit easier to play with. Uh, you can wipe something. everything. Okay. Get rid of VPVR for now. So the way you set it up, right, is you're looking to measure a cycle, right? And so if you're looking at it like a sine wave, something like that, right? And so we like to look from like a low to a low point, right? So look at something like that's 30 days, or you can look at something it's like 15 days. So it depends on the average lengths of the cycle of the chart relevant to the time period you're looking at. And so some bigger movements, um, you know, like that's an entire movement, but it's also made up of these kind of smaller 15-ish size ones. So you always want to eyeball the chart and figure out what's, what's the average cycle length. And so because uh, you always got to dial it in because fixed length indicators are always susceptible to errors because the market is never moving at the same length. And so if you never changed your RSI uh, or any of your other values, you're going to have issues um, trying to track trends in the marketplace because it's just simply not the, the market never moves relative to a fixed length interval. Right. And so you always have to be in the habit of changing it. Um, which is the whole point of this, is you're looking for time dilation, right? Right. Um, I got to see if I can move this bar. It's not going to let me. Uh, let's go to 3MA. So, uh, just pull something like that. Make sure. Word. Okay, so the easiest way to trade it, right, is once you have it dialed in, um, I tell people to use a three EMA strategy because it's one of the easiest possible strategies you can use for, uh, use it for, you can use with trading, right? And same with Ichimoku clouds, you always need a target upwards with momentum indicators. So like three EMA is probably the easiest, the most reliable um, indicator set you can use. So once you dial it in, right? And we have it relatively close. Um, it's probably a little bit to me. Yeah, it's pretty dialed in right there. It's a little bit fast, but um, if you were to be back testing it and trading it with like a 3MA strategy, you would be looking for the bog to make a bottom, right? But you don't usually buy on the first bottom, right? Same thing with the RSI. You're always looking for divergences. And so as price drops under the EMA, you know that price will always return to the EMAs. It's just, it's a, it's a law that has to do with price valuation of assets in moving marketplaces. And so if you had this dialed in to the price cycle, which you would have back here, you would have looked for this first bottom and then the bull div, right? Because you can trade this just like any other indicator. Any indicator that gives divergences, um, absolutely the same concept. It's just clearer, it's smoother, it's faster. Uh, it gives way less fake outs than the RSI. So you would have looked for the first bottom, it makes a bull div, and you would have bought right here with a target being any of the EMAs. And so like it goes up here, you would have seen it run out of steam, post, let's see, two dojis, and then 
you know, two dojis down here, two dojis up here. So very clear market indecision. You would have closed that position. And so like the same thing down here, bull div, um, which you would have seen coming before it posted because of the five dojis down here and the angle the bog was making. Because once it gets slanted like this, it kind of tells you that the market trend is slowing. So that's something you always want to be looking at. Like this is a very steep trend. Um, but once it kind of flattens out like this, uh, like right here, you can kind of predict that there's going to be a top because it just has to do with the way that, um, you know, the time interval is moving. I'm getting pinged. All right, here we go. And so that's, that's like a basic way to use this and have profitable trades pretty consistently is look for the first bottom, look for the bull div, and then trade up to either your 50 or your 100 EMA. Um, and then we also have little crosses in here. So if you're familiar with like MACD crosses, um, you don't need these, but it's a nice little visual touch. So you can look and be like, oh, you know, they crossed, just kind of helps you look at a glance. Um, but one of the cooler things that we have is called the predictor line. And so the predictor line is taking a geometric evaluation of the trend angle. So it's like a derivative and it has to do with uh, cosine. I can't tell you, can't give it away obviously, but it it's like a derivative of the trend angle, right? And so the momentum line will give you an early indication of the strength of a trend because once the trend starts weakening in terms of its upwards movement, uh, that's not always visible in candles, and indicators also don't always see that just because they're susceptible to wicks, right? And so what the momentum line will do is it gives you kind of an early indication that you should be exiting a trend. And so if you had bought down here, you know, at this bull div, and you would have held and, you know, let's say you got greedy, you didn't take profit, or you re-entered anyway, you're all the way up here. Once this momentum line, being the blue line, started to break away, you'd have a general idea that the trend is about to end and you want to take your profit. And so maybe you wouldn't have sold up here because this looked like a decent, you know, downward fake out, but you have an idea that the trend's done. And so it's kind of an early indication signal, both on uptrends and on downtrends. And so like you can see down here, um, as price falls below the 50 MA, you can, you know, you can have like your horizontal support lines, stuff like that, but you don't usually have a system that calls to bottoms, nor an indication that trend's about to reverse. And so even as the bog moves down, the momentum line right here shifts, and it kind of gives you an early warning that there's going to be a reversal in price. Just to, just to It just has to do with the angle of the trend and the candles as it moves downwards. So that's kind of like the brief overview um, of how you'd use it. So I can take questions. I don't know what else you guys want to know. I kind of just ran through everything that came to my mind that seemed important. No, that was really good. Um, I do have a quick question. Mm -hmm. So one of the biggest problems with ND, ND indicator is that any information that they display is lagging what price already did. So how do you think that this indicator either circumvents that problem or is less susceptible to it? Uh, one, it's dialed in so that we can be predictive rather than reactive, right? And most indicators are reactive. And so to a degree, this is going to be reactive just because it has to read information as it plots. Um, but the math we're using in terms of like the moving averages is sped up to the absolute fastest possible so that it can get, it can tell you about the strength of the trend, where the trend is going as fast as possible. And with the added, um, dialing in of the time cycles, it the predictive nature helps you reduce a lot of the noise and um, fake outs that would come along with normal indicators. Can you show us on Bitcoin, like currently what, what it's seeing? Uh, it's yeah. Which by the way, I hate the RSI. We built this because we hated the RSI so much. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Me too. Good. That's one of the worst. <laughs> worst indicators unfortunately all right so let's see because right now bitcoin is going down a little bit here it's already down below 74 
I actually have it maintaining right now, um, at least in my personal charts. Not seeing anything that would tell me otherwise right now. So measure 13. I'm looking at like right now, like five minutes oh, ago. Right now, yeah, I don't, I haven't been looking at small time frames at all. Small. Let's see how that looks. So you always want to dial it in and make sure that, because uh, like you can measure it, but if it's not going to be representative of the trend because the trend is violating the time sequence, dial it in visually and adjust it to where, um, to where it makes sense. Right. And so like I tried, what was it like seven and 13 that didn't quite work. And so doubling it relatively gives you a rounded bottom here, bottom here, and then coming up to this top. So, and then you can back test looks good. Right. So right now we have a cross, which just occurred in the last 12 hours. And you have the EMA support here with the 150 looking across the 100. And so let's see. I personally believe that we're going to have a re repeat of this fractal right here. Um, because that's kind of what the volume pattern is telling me, the price dynamics. And so I think what's going to happen is the indicator is going to reset somewhere down here, give or take, but price action is going to, price action may take us down to 7,000, but I wouldn't see us going below that, especially with the EMAs. Um, yep. Cool. There, oh, that's a that's a good confirmation there. Yeah. What time frame does this work on best generally? Um, works on anywhere that there is a perceivable trend. Which, since we're in the era of Bart's, every single indicator that relies on candle information is just it's almost trash. Um, because when you're reading Wix, that has you know a statistical outlier that falls in the ninety nine percent, and then sideways movement for hours where price is barely moving, uh, any momentum-based indicator that is following that is just going to get thrown off. So I've been recommending strongly that you look at high enough time frames that the BARTs are not extremely visible. Um, which I think you can do that about two hours. But back when we first developed this, like February or March, we were trading this on two-minute candles. Um, we actually had it automated for a while, but uh, once, like, as long as there's normative price cycles, it's all good. Um, it's just, you know, with these square waves that we're seeing, it's difficult as the market is right now. Um, yeah, those but, are corrections for you. Yeah, I did have, let's see, what was that? Five minutes. To sent a chart to my buddy the other day. Eleven five. This is this is awesome, by the way. Oh, thank you. A lot really of, appreciate you coming on. Yeah, a lot of time and effort went into this. So, uh, so like just for example, settings eleven five and two on five minute candles, profitable scalp. Like you can pretty much see, um, especially with three MA, um, pretty much everything lines up. These pivot points you'd be able to predict looking at previous bottoms and previous tops where there'd be turning points. So any dip like this, that's a 3MA cross, bogs bottomed, buy, long up. I don't personally margin trade, but if you were scalping at this level, um, hmm. I don't see any reason why you shouldn't be extremely profitable. Yeah. So no 100 Xers? <laughs> <laughs> nah, not unless you're Wolf Apollo and you're short in 50 BTC at 16K because your stock RSI is topped. I don't know. So um, you've been talking about dialing in because of the time sequences. How do you react when, let's say, the time sequence is changing? Uh, adjust the indicator accordingly. Right. And what signals do you have to identify that it is changing? Does the indicator start to lag? Uh, yeah. So you'd start to notice that like, um, there'd be deviations in what the correct settings would be so like right here we have a correct bottom but then like this bottom starting to get dragged out 
And so that would kind of tell me, because th this setting that I have was um, working for the entire duration of this part all the way to like here-ish. That was when I made it. And so once the trend starts decaying time-wise, you would start looking for a different setting. So something like that, 53, we go, okay, let's set the channel. Let's see, 25 and 50, it's four here. You can see if we're roughly, definitely too fast. Let's see what default does, top. I'll slower. This is definitely a weird, weird candle formation right there. Um, and like I said, it's getting really difficult to use momentum indicators uh, on BitMEX just because of like all the sideways movement. Mm -hmm. But on like larger time frames, it's a lot more apparent. Um, let's see. Do you mind if I delete this? Yeah, you can go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Just don't want to remove precious TA. I know how that is. <laughs> see so let's go back let's go back roughly like right here because this looks like it'd be different enough so this bottom right here pretty tight 24s it's like 10 20. find a shifting trend for you it's still pretty dial in so like right here right here because this is the bottom and so these settings were made for period previous, but you can see this is where it's starting to hiccup, right? And so that'd be kind of my signal that I need to change up the settings a little bit. And so perhaps a little bit faster, obviously these wicks are super clustered because it was a flag, um, but look and go like, all right, let's see what eight and 16 does. Boom, and like that, that kind of gives you a little bit better. Um, not really. It's still a little bit off, but now it actually filled in. It was just these wicks here. So you'd have like your bull div right here, take it up, and then um, that'd just be kind of how you would adjust it. Is once once it's like not in sync with the cycle, you'd right. be eyeballing it based on low to lows. Uh -huh. No, that makes sense. Best possible way to uh, be adjusting it. And then my last question was the the red bar and the gray bar on the top and the bottom. What are what are they telling you? So same thing with like your RSI, right? So if you've been traditionally trained with that, the seventy is oversold, thirty is overbought. Or sorry, I have that flipped. Um, <laughs> seventy is overbought, thirty is oversold. So this roughly dilates between uh, zero and a hundred zero down to like negative 100, depends on the time frame, depends on the asset. But oversold and overbought are always relative to the cycle that it's in. And so what we wanted to keep in mind is if a trend topped, that maybe it's not at that 70, if you're thinking about it like an RSI. And so we want to keep in mind the most recent top so that you wouldn't try to over, over profit from it. So like something like this right here, where um, bog topped here, fails to top here, you have like this downtrend and then it tops here. It kind of tells you that this, you know, this top is still in effect. Like if you've ever drawn horizontal support and resistance on RSIs, same process, I just automated it for you. And mm -hmm. it keeps it relevant to what the last high and low is. So that you have a general idea. So like right here, um, you you know maybe you'd be looking you're like if it was fixed you'd be looking for like a buy down here but the buy is actually here and so because it shifts and it's dynamic for you once it's up here you're like oh well that you know that's actually probably pretty bottomed and so assuming you see these dojis uh the dynamic tops and bottoms gives you an idea of where the trend is actually and that, so just help it helps uh, you confirm uh confirm the divergence uh, yeah, and it also just, rather than being stuck to like 70 and 30, or, you know, 100 and negative 100, it keeps that relevant past top or bottom on the indicator in mind. Right. Because relative, I mean, like, oversold and overbought are relative to the last top, right? Absolutely, yeah. 
that's why a lot of people that, that say like, oh, well, it's, it's up to 90. So that means sell. But what happens if it goes down $50 and then resets the RSI? Right. Which is why um, so many people got wrecked when Bitcoin was climbing is because they didn't understand the indicators they were using. Um, if you're looking at like your normal RSI and your stock. Oh yeah, look at that Sorry. divergence. Bear stock divergence RSI right there. Absolutely at the ceiling, right? And I think even on the weekly, it's been a while since I looked at this chart. Um, come on, sweetheart. I can't remember which time frame we were looking at. Uh, but the stock, you know, stock goes up to the ceiling. And so you're just waiting, but you don't know where the top is. And the top can drop out on you extremely rapidly like it did at 20K. So if you were margin trading, you bought, you know, I don't know, somewhere on this candle right before the pump. And you're feeling that euphoria. You're like, man, stock RSI is topped, RSI is topped. But it doesn't look like it's coming down people tend to hold on money and that's why people made stupid, stupid shorts because they were using stuff like the RSI or the stock RSI, which just, they don't give an indication of a top correctly, which actually stock RSI is only used for finding bottoms. Uh, I would never ever suggest using it to find tops just as like a little trading tip. Um, it's a good way to get wrecked. <laughs> Extremely good way. <laughs> That's what we do here. Yeah, <laughs> a good way to get bogged. Oh yeah, well that's uh the whole reason it's called the bog is because when we were building it and starting to trade on it manually, it would make turning points, and we were like, no way, like no way we're selling, like it's still going up. It would turn, and after it printed, the market would dump. And so the meme was that it has a direct line to the brothers <laughs> at all times because we're just like, how, how do you know any of this? Like, <laughs> it makes no sense. Yeah, that's really good. Yeah. So I, any other questions? Yes, uh, I have a small question for you. Mm -hmm. um, uh, what about stop losses? How do you trade uh, with it in terms of stop losses? I don't trade with stop losses personally. Another one. My yeah, man. I used to. I don't trade with them. If you use something like 3MA and you have an indicator supporting this, like say an OBV or some volume indication, when it's bottomed and you have your price target being up here, you know that it's going to go back up there. And so, like, you know, if it starts dumping, sure, I'll stop out, but I don't, I don't stop out. I know for a fact well, it'll yeah. go back up here. You don't um, risk more than you're willing to, more than you're, you're, you can afford to lose. Yeah, and I don't usually, um, I usually trade with my whole stack, actually. I don't do uh -huh. it now because there's not enough liquidity, but I used to scalp on 5 and 15 minutes with, uh, I think my trading stack was a corn at that size, uh, at that time. And so you just buy down here and sell. And if it goes up, it goes up, but I don't care, I had profit. And so you just rinse and repeat that forever. Um, but yeah.